Hey guys, so my name is Jeff and I am currently in between my third and fourth year of medical school. I'm trying to get back to your emails and so I apologize but I haven't forgotten and apologize for the delay. My This video I want to share with you some fun, commonsensical things that I just recently picked up. One which is that definitely do a Google search and be aware of your newsletters. If there are medical and surgical conferences going to your backyard, then go to them because they can be really inspiring. So I went to the American College of Surgeons, American Academy of Pediatrics conferences in DC and in Chicago. And what I realized was how fun they were. Um, the registration rates are free. You get to learn the most latest, the latest and newest innovation studies, technology, and at the same time, yet at the same time, a lot of medical students aren't there. And so, for example, I was riding the Chicago subway one day and I met a medical student from Rush and she told me that she, or some of her friends wanted, like to do surgery, and but they ended up not going to the conference, which is too bad because um, it's just a great opportunity because those conferences also rotate schedules. So they don't always, they're not always in Chicago. They sometimes are in San Francisco, San Antonio, in the Midwest, in the East Coast. So definitely get a chance to check it out because it's a rare opportunity to see some of the world's most famous physicians talk about very exciting medical developments. The other thing I want to share with you is something from The New Yorker. So, in the April 5th, 2010 issue, Atul Gawande talks about something that I haven't really picked up in the mainstream media. I haven't really seen them focus that much. And so I'm just going to read, if that's okay, because I think he does a better job. Or I'll paraphrase a little bit first. So, in 1965, when Medicare, which is a popular reform package in the United States, it, when, that was, when that was implemented, it actually had a lot of attacks and was very close to not being implemented, even though they passed the bill. And similarly, the health care reform bill right now, there's a lot of anger about it. And, and because the provisions for this year's reform bill are going to be carried out over a long period of time, there, it's actually even more vulnerable to attack, according to uh, Gawande. So one thing that's not talked about is this story, though, and I want to share with you this story. So, starting off with this paragraph, recently clinicians at Children's Hospital adopted a, s a more systematic approach for managing inner city children who suffer severe asthma attacks by introducing a bundle of preventive measures. Insurance would cover just one prescribing inhaler, but the hospital decided to pay for the rest, which included nurses who would visit parents after discharge and make sure that they had their child's medicine, knew how to administer it, and had a follow appointment with a pediatrician home inspections for molds and pests, and vacuum cleaners for families without one, which is cheaper than medication. After a year, the hospital readmission rates for these patients actually dropped by more than 80%, and costs plunged, but an empty hospital bed is a revenue loss, and asthma is Children's, hospital le children's Hospital's leading source of admissions. Under the current system, this sensible program could threaten to bankrupt it. So far, neither the government nor the insurance companies have figured out a solution. The most interesting, under-discussed, and potentially revolutionary aspect of the law of this current health care reform bill is that it doesn't pretend to have the answers. Instead, through a new Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, it offers to free communities and local health care systems and local health systems from existing payment rules. Sorry, it offers to free communities and local health systems from existing payment rules and to let them experiment with ways to deliver better care at lower costs. In large part, it entrusts the task of devising cost-saving health care innovation to communities like Boise and Buffalo and Boston, rather than to drug and device companies and the public and private insurers that have failed to do so. This, way, this is the way costs will come down or not. That's the one true scary thing about healthcare reform. Far from being a government takeover, it counts on local communities and clinicians for success. We are the ones to determine whether costs are controlled and healthcare improves, which is to say whether reform survives and resistance is defeated. So anyways, I thought I would share that with you. It was thought-provoking in that 
we don't really hear about that center which is counting on local clinicians and future future clinicians like you and me to for success of the healthcare reform package. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to share with you some of my own personal thoughts of this past year. So I'm in between three and four, uh, the third and fourth year of medical school, but my, a lot of my classmates, half the class has gradu is graduating this year and half is graduating next year because half will be taking this extra year that I am taking off either doing research or getting an advanced degree, a master's degree in public health, for example, or master's of business administration, master of public policy, but the other half is just directly going into residency. And so in speaking to a lot of my classmates, what we have noticed is that a lot of us started off very enthusiastic, and that was where I was when I first put up my healthcare, um, my YouTube videos, uh, three, three years ago, I think. And over the years, medical school and the medical system, it's really beaten down on us so that we're not quite as idealistic as we were in the past. And so I encourage you to start off very optimistic and very idealistic because I've spoken to some undergrads who start off with being moderately skeptical, and which is, it's important to be skeptical, but I think try not to be too skeptical of the system because if you do then I think it, you risk becoming too much of a cynic by the end of residency and because I've noticed that the one that the people who are really idealistic were now kind of beaten down to a moderate sense of idealism and this is not to say that everybody will always become a skeptic and a cynic um, but I think that it's really important to start off medical school with a lot of momentum because if you don't, there are going to be many obstacles that will beat you down, definitely beat you down and make you aware of your own limitations. And so I think for me, that's kind of why I stopped posting up YouTube videos for a while because I felt this acute sense of my own limitations and was doubtful of my own ability to make a difference in this world. And I think I wouldn't have turned it around were it not for this research year where you have more time to be inspired to step back and to realize that, yeah, you might be a cog in the wheel in the hospital, but you're still able to make one-on-one -on -one differences. You're still able to have a little bit of a free time when you finish residency to get back and to make, try to make an improvement for the things that you really care about. And another thing that I encourage you to do if you have the chance is to continue exploring, no matter how busy you are, to give yourself time to explore. So I was very fortunate that my friend dragged me out to the Harvard Social Enterprise Conference where I met a lot of people in nonprofit, for profit in, uh, organizations who are trying to do social good. So, for example, trying to make organic fair trade coffee or trying to help improve healthcare in disadvantaged communities in the United States or abroad. And one thing that I learned from that, so I just got a huge dose of enthusiasm and idealism from them because they were get it done types. They realized what was going on with, what was going wrong with society, but did not feel so jaded and were able to continue making a difference and not feeling apologetic about it. So sometimes, for example, people will apologize for saying that, they'll, they'll say, I know it's a cliche, but I want to help make a difference in the world. Well, those people did not apologize, they did not think it was a cliche, and it was very exciting and um, uplifting to be in that atmosphere. So if you feel that you are a little bit funk uh in a funk and in a rut then i encourage you to go to that because i was in i was in a not very exciting place in my life and it's good to get to be surrounded by people who are still passionate about things so anyways hope this is helpful and i will talk to you soon all right thanks bye